Thank you, Mr. Guruman. A very warm welcome to you, ladies and gentlemen, to the 10th and last webinar of our series, Anti-Semitism in South Asia in Comparative Perspective. We are very privileged and honored to have with us Professor Anna Gutmann as the speaker for today's webinar. She is a professor in the Department of English at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay, Ontario, where she teaches post-colonial literature. She is the chair of the Association for Commonwealth Language and Literature Studies, the oldest and largest international organization dedicated to the study of post-colonial literature. She is the author of Writing Indians and Jews, Metaphorics of Jewishness in South Asian Literature, published in the year 2013, and The Nation of India in Contemporary Indian Literature, published in the year 2007. She is also the co-editor of The Global Literary Field, published in the year 2006. She publishes in a variety of areas, including Jewish studies, gender and sexuality studies, globalization studies, and popular culture. So it is with great pleasure that I invite Professor Gutman to speak to us today on anti-Semitism in South Asian literature in the English language. Thank you. Thank you very much, Navaras, and, and thanks to the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism Policy for having me here today. So I'll start with just a little bit of background about me. 20 years ago, when I was a PhD student at the University of Leeds, I was working on a dissertation on nation and nationalism in Indian literature, but I kept running into a phenomenon that I couldn't quite explain. I was looking primarily at the work of fairly canonical Indian writers in English, such as Salman Rushdie and Anita Desai, and I expected and found in those novels characters negotiating a diversity of religious and cultural identities in the context of the Indian nation state. What I didn't expect was just how many of the characters I encountered were Jews. I should explain that the fact that there were Jews in India wasn't entirely new to me, but I didn't have much knowledge at that point of Jews in India beyond the fact that Jews both had a long history in India and were also few in number. And so I asked myself, what were all these Jewish characters doing in the work of writers like Salman Rushdie, who at this point was really most famous for his representations of Muslim and diasporic identity? I asked my PhD supervisor what she thought, and she told me that probably this was because Rushdie had made Jewish friends while he was living in London, which was where he lived at the time. I didn't find that answer very satisfying, and the existing criticism didn't help me much either. So I finished my PhD on nations and nationalisms, but I still had this lingering question in the back of my brain. The more Indian literature I read, the more Jewish characters I found. What was going on? My attempt to answer that question was the impetus for my 2013 book, Jews and Indians, Metaphorics of Jewishness and South Asian Literature. Um, I ended up discussing about 50 primary texts that dealt with Jews and South Asian literature in English. And today I'll talk a little bit about what I found and discussed in that book with a couple of examples, as well as about my ongoing research into representation of Jews and Jewishness in contemporary South Asian literature in English, with a particular focus on anti-Semitism. The book itself posits that representations of Jews in Indian literature and English perform a number of functions. I argue that far from being a subject of theological or ethnographic interests, the Jew in the literature of South Asia and its diasporas provides a set of discursive practices for negotiating transnational and non-local identities, such as South Asian Muslim, diasporic Indian, and global citizen. This makes discussing anti-Semitism in some of these books challenging. When Jewish experience or Jews as Jews are peripheral or merely incidental to the text thematics, um, and the overall message of the book affirms identities as hybrid diasporic or transnational, traditional understandings of anti-Semitism don't always fit. Salman Rushdie's notorious 1989 novel, The Satanic Verses, provides an illustrative example. Now, many of you will recall that that novel became most famous for its controversial depictions of Islam and by extension for the fatwa issued against Rushdie in response. But what's important for me here is that it pairs its two male Muslim protagonists, Saladin and Jibril, with Jewish women. And both women serve as foils for the men's negotiations of diasporic identity, religion, and ethnicity. In particular, Mimi Mamoulian, who is Saladin's co-star on the highly successful fictional television program, The Alien Show, is called in the novel, quote, his female equivalent. 
The co-stars are selected to share the limelight on this aptly named show because they are both masters of mimicry and because their racialized bodies mark them as unfit to appear on the television as themselves. And of course, in that focus on mimicry, you might recognize a reference to a long history of discourse about Jews. Both Saladin and Mimi are notable for their ventriloquism and mastery of voice and accents, and in the professional realm, voice is all they are. They perform on the alien show hidden under heavy makeup and silicon body parts with their own racialized bodies unrepresentable. The physical description of Mimi in the novel, a short, dark, and round body, not only places her outside the normal Western beauty, but is strongly reminiscent of stereotypes about Jewish women. And these stereotypes, not just physical, but cultural, come up again and again in the novel. Yet she's also a complex and fully realized character who consistently educates other characters on European history and the structures of oppression. Even more obvious anti-Jewish views expressed by characters in the Satanic Verses are complex and do not seem designed within the overall structure of the novel to advocate for or defend anti-Semitism. For example, in one of the, the novel's many subplots, and you know, this is an extremely long novel, which in true Rushdie fashion has many characters and many subplots, but in one, we find a character named Hind, who is an immigrant cook and co-owner of the Shandar Cafe and a practicing religious Muslim. She learns that her daughter Michelle has been having an affair with a local lawyer who happens to be black and is not a practicing Muslim. His name is Hanif Johnson. So Hind goes on a long rant when she finds about her daughter's uh, sexual life, complaining among other things of the humiliation of being, and I quote here, stuck in this city full of Jews and strangers who lumped her in with the Negroes, unquote. Notably, the words Jew and Negro there are both written in lowercase. And his distinction between Jews and strangers indicates the simultaneously particular and indeterminate position of Jews. Neither like her nor an undifferentiated other, which is what strangers are, they are implicitly coded as white in contrast to quote, the Negroes, to use the text term. Hinn's dislike of being lumped with those of African descent indicates her own racializing tendencies as well as the sense of her own racial ambiguity. On the one hand, the uncomfortable proximity of Jew and South Asian Muslim here is coded into the dominant perspective of the white British shopkeeper next door, who when asked to define the word, quote, Paki, says, brown Jew. On the other hand, it's pretty clear that when we read this novel, we're not supposed to sympathize with him or take on board her views, right? She is clearly racist. On the other hand, the novel invites us to have much more sympathy with the young Michelle, whose attraction to Hanif is very genuine, and Hanif himself is a pretty likable character. In this context, the term Jew clearly does not denote membership in either a specific religious or cultural group. Instead, Jews are, in the words of the novel, simply people set apart, rendered objectionable. And that is also a quote. So the novel as a whole does not endorse anti-Semitic thinking, I would argue. But the problem of Hinn's anti-Semitism, and therefore anti-Semitism in general, remains very much unresolved. Indeed, quite a few contemporary writers, and I'd point to Manzi Islam in his novel, Burrow, and Sarnath Bonnery in his graphic novel, The Barn Owl's Wondrous Caper, to offer just a couple of examples, introduced Jewish histories in Britain as a background against which members of the South Asian diaspora struggle to form their own identities and claim a space within the British nation. While this can be a positive affiliation, and it is in many cases, identification with Jewish characters can also serve as a mark of non-white vulnerability. In Hanif Qureshi's short story called We're Not Jews, there's a young boy named Azar who's bullied at school. He and his mother, Yvonne, suffer racist abuse by the perpetrator, Little Billy, and his father, Big Billy, as all four characters ride the bus home after meeting with the school headmistress. So they've all gone to the school and met with the headmistress in response to the fact that Little Billy is bullying Azar at school. The conductor and other passengers all ignore Big Billy's and Little Billy's intimidation of Azar and his mother. The only response Yvonne can muster is the story's title. We're not Jews. That's what she says. Big Billy responds, you know Yid Yvonne, you us, but worse, going with the Paki. And that's a quote from the story. For Qureshi, Jewishness and South Asianness function as metaphorical equivalents here, incurring both the same possibilities of cultural influence and transformation, but it's also the same risks of loss and commodification. As Sandra Gilman explains, commenting on the story, Brits of Pakistani descent, quote, understand how easily they too could become the victims of racial persecution. They have the potential of becoming, he quotes, yids. Yet this identification does not always produce understanding nor the repudiation of stereotypes. In Satanic Verses, Saladin, the protagonist, even though he's paired with his fellow alien Mimi Mamoulian and they have a close personal and professional relationship, maintains throughout the novel that he was, quote, 
brought up to have views on Jews. He therefore refuses her romantic overture, despite the fact that the two characters otherwise seem like a likely couple, and in fact, she kind of saves him at many crucial points in the novel. But many other things change about him in the course of the text. I mean, this is not a realist text. Among other things, Saladin transforms into a goat. Um, his inability to reconcile his intimacy with Mimi and his learned anti-Semitism remain until the end. Likewise, Yvonne's response in We're Not Jews suggests a troubling possibility of assimilation into Britain um, via achieve, like achieved via shared anti-Semitism. Indeed, the role that Jewishness plays in these texts can be quite complex. Another example I'd like to discuss in some detail is Ruth Bonnerji's 2007 graphic novel, The Barn Owl's Wondrous Capers. This book quite overtly resurrects the figure of the wandering Jew and in the opening pages, which form a sort of prologue, takes care to situate this legend within its Christian and early modern origins. So the main character of the novel, Abravanel, is positioned relative to a number of canonical, visual, musical, and literary texts that have been pivotal in constructing not only the wandering Jew as a cultural trope, but Jews in general. I can't go through all of them today, but to offer one example, Gustave Doré's woodcut, The Wandering Jew, appears immediately behind the narrator when he's inside his apartment. And in fact, this is a backdrop to um, another character with whom Abravanel is paired. It's the only photo and the densest area of the page, so it forms the visual center of the frame. The image, evoking the tradition of the wandering Jew as a figure cursed by Christ, depicts a decrepit old man looking wistfully at Christ on the cross as he trudges through a gloomy landscape. The second frame on the page is a close-up of the image's title and attribution. So like, just in case you missed it and didn't pick out Dav Doré, um, the text provides you with a frame where it actually it's zooms in not only on the image, making it clear, but also, in fact, provides a little label telling you that it is Gustave Doré's woodcut. The Barn Allo's Wondrous Capers also revives many of the legends associated with the figure of the Jew as wandering, as well as revisiting imposter figures such as the Count of Saint Germain, who some believe was the wandering Jew. This is not the text's only engagement with stereotypes of Jewishness. So the text also suggests that Jews introduced the concept of insurance to India, which was in fact brought by the British and alludes to a well-known anti-Semitic discourse in Britain associating Jews with insurance fraud. The association of Jews with insurance is part of a larger discourse in which the Jew, to quote Norman Potteritz, is quote, manipulator of malign powers dangerous to everyone else. Now, in the novel as a whole, Banerjee seems to celebrate Abhinav's rootless cosmopolitanism, which provides an idyllic template for young Indians negotiating their identities in the context of India's increased globalization. In fact, this book fits within a larger set of narratives by Banerjee um, that look at a you know, younger generation of technological workers, such as a character named Israel Dutta, who also appears in Banerjee's earlier novel, Corridor. And so the Barnell's Wondrous Capers has largely been received in that context of celebrating rootless cosmopolitanism. Yet I would argue that the comment Sandra Gilman makes about Vikram Seth's Two Lives, another text that I don't have time to talk about here, but which fits this paradigm, he says, where Jew was, Indian is. The Indian is the new hybrid postmodern citizen of the world. Now this substitution would give me pause on its own, but the fact that the graphic novel in particular fails to acknowledge the dramatic history of the stereotype of the wandering Jew is more troubling still. And indeed many readers who, and critics who looked at this book haven't necessarily realized that the wandering Jew is a stereotype with a specific history. The association of Jewish identity with the non-local, of course, has a long history, and it is one that is of increasing interest to post-colonial theory. Kwame Anthony Appia, for example, turns in his 2006 book, Cosmopolitanism, to George Eliot's Daniel Deronda as the epitome of a successful negotiation of national, human, and what he calls hereditary identity, without mentioning Deronda's eventual turn to Zionism, which is pretty important in that text, or the novel's problematic embrace, noted by Amir Mufti, um, of Deronda's essential Jewish otherness, and Mufti discusses this in his book, Enlightenment in the Colony. There is thus an anti-Semitic undercurrent to Daniel Deronda that Apia doesn't adequately address. Nevertheless, on a literary level, Jewishness is an essential component of cosmopolitanism for many post-colonial writers. Amitav Ghosh's 2002 travel narrative in an antique land, which tells the story of the polyglot, globe-trotting medieval trader Abraham Yeju may be emblematic of that narrative mode. Yet that very cosmopolitanism can struggle to incorporate Jewish specificity and often works best when religious and linguistic differences are sublimated. So 
The Western trope of the Jew as every man discussed in a range of critical work by scholars such as Brian Chayette and Jonathan Friedman is not without its problems and can resonate troublingly for post-colonial writers. Certainly there's a danger not only in equating Jew to victim, which is what arguably occurs in Hanif Qureshi's short story, We're Not Jews, which I've just discussed, but in erasing the specificity of Jewish experience on the Indian subcontinent and elsewhere. As Dora Ahmad puts it, and I quote, Indian Jews represent the ultimate test of the category of Indianness to absorb diverse subjects. Jews are important both in their own right, but also as symbolic of a more generalized minority existence in India. Indeed, narratives about Indian Jews are deployed for diverse political purposes in South Asia, not just to advocate for cosmopolitanism as Amitav Ghosh does, but in support of claims by the Hindu right that religious discrimination doesn't and never has existed in India, which is of course a dubious and very pointed claim um, and is an attempt to undermine other Indian religious minorities, particularly Muslims who complain of discrimination or mistreatment. Even in the very specific context of Indian Jewry, however, debate over identity and belonging can become sublimated into philosophical questions that lose sight of historical and cultural specifics. And I'd like to turn now to discussing a more recent novel, which is the 2017 novel, Aliyah, The Last Jew in the Village. This was originally written in Malayalam by A. Satyamaravan. But I'm gonna be talking about the English translation, which Sethu himself was actually involved in overseeing. And it's his first major novel to be published in English, though he has achieved a significant reputation for himself as a writer, writing in Malayalam for many years at this point. So this novel tells the story of Salomon, the titular last Jew, who elects to remain in India in the fictional South Indian village of Chandamangalam, while the rest of the local Jews migrate to Israel. This Jim Salomon to witness and perform the death of the community. The question of whether Jews are among India's indigenous peoples implicitly underpins much of the more philosophical questions of identity that occupy Sethi's Aliyah. The Salomon and the other Jews in Aliyah debate the merits of leaving India for Israel and the text non-Jewish characters respond in kind. Questions of Jewish belonging are thrown into relief. Indeed, if Cochinian Jews are not indigenous, then their outmigration becomes not so much a departure, not so much a departure, pardon me, from native soil, that's the word Sethi uses, but quote, a return. Salomon seems to be both native and non-native at different points in the text. His eagerness to look inside a wooden chest that had belonged to his deceased mother, for example, is compared to that of, quote, the white man who went in search of treasure among the aboriginals. So that seems to suggest that Salomon is somehow an outsider. But at the conclusion of the novel, we're told that Salomon is, and I quote again, the last Jew who was buried in the soil of his birth, which seems to be an argument for his indigeneity. And this is rather important because within the context of, you know, discourse around the decline of the Kerala and Jewish community, if one interprets Jews as indigenous to India, then this becomes a kind of loss that needs to be understood and mourned. But if one interprets Kerala and Jews as basically, and I put this in scare quotes, foreign, then the decline of the population becomes positioned as inevitable and perhaps even natural. India, according to the 1992 Anti-Semitism World Report, which was produced by the Institute of Jewish Affairs, um, I quote here, had been considered for centuries a country free of anti-Semitism. Thus, it is often imagined that there was little reason for Jews to have emigrated from India, which they did in large numbers in the 50s and 60s and beyond. But the reality is more complex, as Ruby Daniel, a community elder herself from Kerala, explains. And she says, why were the Cochin Jews eager to go to Israel? For them, Israel was kadosh or holy. That was the first reason. Then for some, there was the chance to improve their situation. Some were living in poverty without work. Some wouldn't work for non-Jews because they didn't want to work on Shabbat and festivals. Many were afraid to send their children outside for education, especially the girls for fear they might go away and get converted or something. Indeed, the community had struggled for some time prior to the beginning of the migration in the 1950s. According to David Mandelbaum, a Jewish anthropologist trained in an Orientalist tradition, and I quote him, during the last half of the 19th century, the status of the community steadily sank. And that's him writing in 1939, so before there was any major outmigration. According to TK Manon, a Hindu and Indian nationalist, also writing in the 1930s, by the 1930s, Jews in Kerala had no market influence. This is him writing about Kerala from a sort of an Indian nationalist perspective. Both affirm that a variety of factors pose challenges to Jewish life in Kerala. 
Well, Ruby Daniel points out that Jews were certainly not persecuted in India, and I quote, they also did not have the right to free religious expression since they could be penalized in both the public and private sectors if they refused to work on holy days. Daniel further recounts that during the Israeli War of Independence in 1948, the Cochin Jews decided to pray for the safety of their co-religionists in the Middle East. Hearing this, and she says, I'm quoting here, the Muslims started praying for the Arabs. A large pro-Palestinian rally was planned for Cochin and the Jews, quote, were frightened that the mob might get out of control. Ruby Daniel recalls. The Jews were asked to stay indoors at that time because the Muslims going to the meeting passed through Jewtown, though there was another way to go to the meeting place. Remember, we all got inside the house and locked up the doors and peeped through the keyholes. The people in thousands were passing the whole breadth of the road full for half an hour, young and old. I wonder if they knew anything about what was happening in Palestine except for the hatred of the Jews. I think there's a lot going on in this passage. Um, Ruby Daniel, rightly or not, kind of assumes a background of anti-Semitism quite explicitly, which she then doesn't really go on to explain. So whether or not one can measure it objectively, this was clearly part of her perception of her own experience. That meeting later disperses without incidents and really nothing happens despite Ruby's fear and the fear of other community members. Um, indeed, a number of speakers withdraw at the last minute and the local government um, you know, seeks to calm tensions and head off any potential violence, sends everybody home and nothing really happens. Despite the peaceful outcome, this incident no doubt served as a powerful reminder of the coaching Jewish community, particularly in a state founded in a bloody process of communal exclusion. Furthermore, the fear of religious conversion that Ruby Daniel identifies had a basis in fact. Education in Kerala was largely controlled by Christian missionary organizations and Hindu Nair societies. So Jews were allowed to enroll in Christian schools, but the explicit evangelical agenda of those institutions was uncomfortable for some Jewish families. As Sethu depicts in Aliyah, these tensions over education came to a head during the Vimocha Samara or liberation struggle, which was an anti-communist backlash that occurred in Kerala during the late 1950s. On the one hand, the Jewish community had its own suspicions and concerns regarding the missionary school system. On the other hand, Jews were aware of the anti-Semitic ideologies that had taken hold in the Soviet Union by the 1950s and had reason to fear that Indian communists might be susceptible to the same beliefs. Those Jews who preferred not to take a position in either camp similarly courted charges of disloyalty. Kerala Jews specifically and Indian Jews more generally therefore responded to a specific and complex set of social, economic, and political circumstances in which anti-Semitism was neither the dominant factor nor entirely absent as they decided to either remain in India or leave. Ruby Daniel, who made Aliyah herself in the 1950s, discusses how she first thought of leaving when she met a shaliach, or Israeli emissary from the kibbutz movement, who was specifically sent to India to recruit new members. Daniel was most interested in the kibbutz's commitment to gender equality and the promise that she would be supported in her old age if she contributed during work, her working years. So to put that into context, uh, Ruby Daniel had already decided at this point that she didn't want to marry or have children and feared that this would leave her alone and destitute in her old age if she chose to remain in India. Furthermore, in the context of the 1950s, you know, her decision to remain single was not universally embraced either by her except in the Indian Jewish community or the community at large, and she felt under a lot of pressure um, to live in a way that she didn't wish to. Ruby Daniel said that others in her community emigrated during the 1950s and 60s for economic reasons, to find a spouse, to receive further education, or in the case of some younger emigres, simply to put some distance between themselves and older family members who are viewed as overtly religious, politically or culturally restrictive. Sethu's novel Aliyah does give some attention to the role of local politics in these various events and social relations that I've outlined here. Yet the specific circumstances of Kerala and Jews have been ignored by reviewers and readers. Aliyah the novel has been much celebrated with its launch in English translation inaugurated by the prominent diplomat and author Shashi Tharoor in an event that was widely reported on in the Indian press and received both newspaper and TV coverage. Tharoor at the launch described the novel, and I'm quoting here, as a rather interesting depiction of the contrary poles of identity and longing. What is your identity? Is it the racial memory, as it were, or is it the place and the people with whom you always lived? Where is your allegiance? Where is your love and loyalty? who commands it. I am quoting here the coverage of the launch in the Times of India. The Ruiz Review simultaneously evokes the anti-Semitic trope of dual loyalty, while also paradoxically avoiding the topic of Kerala and Jewry entirely. 
Well, questions of Jewish loyalty often animate anti-Semitic discourse, and in the Indian context, accusations of supposedly foreign loyalties are more, most frequently leveled against not Jews, but Indian Muslims. While Thoreau does not overtly make such a substitution of Muslim for Jew, the novel Aliyah implicitly invites one, and other texts make such substitutions far more explicit. There exist several adaptations of The Merchant of Venice in which Sherlock is Muslim and the other character is Hindu. Such substitutions can be a tool for exploring the place of minorities in India more generally without speaking directly about the fraught and politicized history of communalism on the subcontinent. Set in California, Shishir Kurup's Merchant on Venice is a contemporary rewriting of Shakespeare's play that tells the story of a Muslim merchant who lends money to diasporic Hindus, demonstrating the way religious tensions formed on the subcontinent spill into the diaspora, but with a twist, because in Kurup's play, there's a threat of deportation that is wielded against Shylock, so the play also addresses um, issues around um, immigration to the United States. In his 2001 book, Shylock's children, Derek Pensler notes similarities, and I quote, between Jews and other middlemen minorities living in diaspora. These minorities engage in low status but essential commercial occupations, experience considerable social hostility, and concentrate in small independent enterprises. Such similarities are repeatedly literalized in fiction. Indians, according to the hotel proprietor in the unnamed African nation and Bharati Mukherjee's short story, The World According to Sue, are called Les Juifs d'Afrique, or the Jews of Africa. Their shops are being looted in the story because of their perceived avarice. A similar threat lurks in M.G. Basanji's 2004 novel, The In-Between World of Vikram Lal, which expressly identifies the Indian in East Africa with Shylock. B.S. Nepal explores the same theme in his 1979 novel, A Bend in the River, where the wealthy Indar of Indian descent moved to England from an unnamed East African country in order to attend university. He takes up acting, but there are no parts ready made for him. So the company has the, quote, the idea of rewriting The Merchant of Venice as the Melindy banker so that he could play Shylock. Though the production never comes to fruition, both Indar and his British companions accept his status as the economic Jew. In addition to such literal substitutions, the Jew and Muslim may prove substitutable in a more elliptical way. In the absence of a culturally available language or established institutions of memorialization, documented by J. Edward Mallow in the 2012 book, memory, nationalism, and narrative in contemporary South Asia, writers have been spurred to look for other tropes and other forms to remember partition and violence. Jewish, ex Jewish experience generally and the Holocaust more specifically may provide that framework. This occurs in a number of ways. Though Jews were not the overt targets of partition and violence, India's rise in communalism nevertheless impacted them. In some cases, as Sadia Shepherd recounts, Jews encountered communal hatred directly as in the story of a community member named David, who, accosted by a Muslim mob in what was then Bombay, revealed his circumcised penis in order to convince the potential attackers that he was not a Hindu. This produces a bodily identification between Jew and Muslim that appears repeatedly in literature written by both Jews and non-Jews. Indeed, the fear of having one's religious identity discovered via bodily inspection in these texts resonates with Holocaust narratives. The Holocaust may also provide a symbolic analog for partition um, for some South Asian writers. And in Egypt decides Baumgartner's Bombay, for example, the Jewish refugee functions as a reminder of India's lost Muslims. So that novel traces uh, the story of a fictional character named Baumgartner who leaves Germany in the context of the Holocaust to take refuge in India where he then remains the rest of his life. Um, he loses his family and kind of spends the rest of his life in you know, social, cultural, personal isolation. Such substitutions are necessarily fraught. The titular character is not only presented as a trace of the departed Indian Muslim, but pointedly detached from Jewish community and culture in that novel, something I discuss in detail in my book. Indeed, in Baumgartner's Bombay, it is other characters, not Baumgartner, who speak the word Jew. The process of erasing Baumgartner's Jewishness has even leaked beyond the boundaries of the text into the critical discourse. Thus, Elaine Ho argues that Baumgartner is culturally indeterminate, and Rekha Kamath and Rainer Lotz describe him as, quote, an empty space. Tony De Silva goes so far as to argue that Baumgartner is, quote, both physically and psychologically the white man, which I found particularly odd because in the context of Baumgartner's Holocaust experience, he sets himself against the white man. De Silva's assertion that the reader of Desai's novel shares, and I quote, a common cultural heritage in which the self is at home anywhere, positions this text um, as both by and about a global cosmopolitan subject. Um, but as Amir Mufti points out, Baumgartner becomes nothing but, and I quote here, a trace, a shadow, or a whisper of his own degradation, which doesn't really seem like much of a celebratory model of cosmopolitanism. Clearly decides now what leans on the stereotype of the Jew as victim. 
indeed, the substitution of Jew for Muslim here can be read as an act of erasure of both Jew and Muslim alike, I would argue. Though very different, both Baumgartner and Bombay and Aliyah struggle, both novels struggle to see Jews as part of the present and not just part of the past. If both critics and reviewers are quick to rescue Baumgartner from the specifics of his relatively unusual experience as a German Jewish refugee in India and launch him into the realm of the universal, it's in fact a testimony to decide efficiency in realizing her stated artistic goals. Because she herself has said in an interview that writing about Baumgartner was an attempt to move beyond the material that India could provide, she wanted a larger context. Addressing the popularity of the novel in interview, Desai attributes his success to the fact that, and I quote, the key to the work is a European key, a Western key. India is really superfluous as far as, and this is in italics, American readers are concerned. But this key is though, Desai declines to define. And I've discussed at length elsewhere how writing about Jews might be perceived as good marketing for contemporary South Asian writers. Notably, both Sethu's and Desai's novels, other Muslims and Jews alike, but it's worth pointing out that this substitution can also be used to claim affinity and affiliation. Contemporary diasporic Muslim writers such as Ayat Akhtar took a very different approach to Jewishness as is evident not only in Akhtar's creative work, but an interview. And I'm gonna quote an interview here from 2015. When asked if he regards himself as a Muslim, the author who like Hayat in American Dervish, which is Akhtar's first novel, had an Islamic immersion experience in his early teens that and read that re I'm going to start this again. It's a bit of an awkward quote. When asked if he regards himself as a Muslim, the author, who like Hyatt and American Dervish, had an Islamic immersion experience in his early teens that reading Dostoevsky in high school uprooted, says, I take a lead from my smart Jewish friends and say I identify as a cultural Muslim, which means I feel informed and formed by the ethos and mythos and mindset and the spirituality of the Muslim tradition without believing the literal truth of any of its tenets. Now, compared to the category cultural Jew or secular Jew, the category of cultural Muslim is still relatively new and underused. But Akhtar is hardly the first writer or thinker to use the label for themselves. While the academic use of the term secular Muslim first emerges in the late 1970s and seems to be particularly applied, interestingly, to South Asian Muslims, the term experienced a bit of a renaissance on the heels of the publication of Rushdie's Satanic Verses, with its most prominent academic use being perhaps by the Muslim South Asian poet, Agash Tahir Ali, who uses it to refer to Rushdie. And Akhtar names Rashti as a key Muslim influence in that same interview um, in discussing his own formation as a cultural or secular Muslim. Now, both those terms emerge at about the same time. And anecdotally, they started being used informally in Muslim communities much earlier than their academic use in the 1970s. In emphasizing the Jewish lineage of the category, however, Akhtar and others not only validate a form of identity that some thinkers find contradictory, but curves out a space within the landscape of American identity politics at a time where Muslim identities are the target of substantial scrutiny. While Akhtar is responding specifically to the political landscape of the contemporary US, his claim resonates both elsewhere in the South Asian diaspora and on the subcontinent itself. The analogical function of the Jew then is not necessarily a competitive one. Indeed, it can be used to imagine intimacy and solidarity between Jews and Muslims and Jews and Indians, both in India and abroad. In Akhtar's work, this intimacy and solidarity can be the basis for embracing hybridity and tolerance, Yet even so, there remain unresolved tensions, and particularly as an actor's play, disgrace when Middle Eastern politics enters the picture. To conclude, I'm not necessarily opposed to employing Jewish history, including the Holocaust, as tropes to conceptualize other genocides. And though not universally accepted as such, genocide has been repeatedly invoked in the scholarship to discuss partition. Necessar similarly, echoing Michael Rothberg, it is not inherently problematic and need not be competitive to place Jewish histories and literatures more broadly into conversation with those of other religious and cultural groups. Indeed, it can be highly useful to do so, and all of the books I've discussed here are indeed somewhat generative in their own way. But as I have demonstrated, stereotypes of Jewishness, substitutions of Jews by and for other groups, and sublimations of Jewish difference into a vague ethnic otherness or even every man status all have their attendant dangers. South Asian literature may still fall prey to such dangers, despite its post-colonial commitments. Thank you very much. And I look forward to taking questions. Thank you, Professor Gutman, for your most insightful lecture. Uh, uh, the, now the floor is open for questions. Should there be any questions, feel free to post your question in the chat box 
or just raise your hand and we will unmute you. Okay, while we get questions, Oh, okay, there is a, a question from Ms. Benzimon. So, yeah. Hi, yes. sorry to, um, I just wanted to, I'm not very familiar with, uh, um, I, I met some Indian Jewish people in Israel, but um, when does the Indian presence uh, start in India? Where can we retrace it to? So, I mean, that's a large historical question, um, and there's some debate in the scholarship. But I mean, the thinking is that in the Kerala Jewish community in South India, it could be as old as 2000 years old. There's three distinct Jewish communities um, anthropologists believe in India. So there's the South Indian community like centered in Kerala and Cochin. Um, that's where Ruby Daniel's from, and I focused on that example. Um, there's also a B'nai Israel community that's sort of centered on the Western coast of India, um, Gujarat, Mumbai, and so forth. The exact historical origins of that community is debated. I mean, the community has a, has a story about um, being shipwrecked on the coast of the Western coast of India, um, you know, well over a thousand years ago. There's not kind of academic historical evidence that bears out that story, but certainly the community is recorded for several hundred years. Um, there's a Calcutta um, based community that has immigrant roots in Iraq. And that seems to have communities seem to further developed primarily in like the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries um, with connections to, you know, the much older Jewish community of Iraq. Um, so there's, there's just sort of one community with one set of historical roots. That's, you know, my, obviously there's more detail. That's my relatively short answer. I see. India is not one country. It's like 50 different countries, so I'm sure there must be a lot of confusion concerning that. Uh, um, um, what do you make of that, that um, parallel that in literature we find Muslims identifying with or replacing the Jewish identity and identifying more or less with the Jewish identity? Why do they do that? I think there are a lot, there's more than one thing going on. And, you know, I, I don't think that I couldn't really in half an hour, I think, touch on every possible yeah. example. If you look at India specifically, um, there are practical reasons for that identification. So, you know, overlaps in dietary traditions and you can find um, histories, for example, of Jewish Indians who maybe couldn't access kosher meat, uh, deciding to eat halal food because it was more accessible you know, the Muslim population has always been larger than the Jewish population in India, and even more generally culturally familiar. Um, so that was seen as, as a similarity. And then, you know, practices like circumcision that were shared were seen as a point of identification. Um, and, you know, in places like Calcutta, where Jews had emigrated there from Iraq, I mean, there was a long history for Jews in Iraq, clearly, of living with a Muslim majority population. So those relationships were, in some ways, had a, a kind of natural precedent. Um, so, you know, that's one, that's one source of, I think, potential identification. Um, you know, in the case of a writer like Rushdie, who's writing about Britain, um, one of the things that he is looking at is, uh, you know, a very literal history of immigration, where sometimes he's looking at neighborhoods whose demographics have changed over time, where neighborhoods that once were dominated by um, Jews have demographically changed to have you know, Pakistani immigrant populations. And so he's interested in the kind of the layering of that history, which is sometimes physical, visible on the landscape. And several of these writers, I didn't get to talk about this, are interested in the Fieldgate Synagogue, which is a very old synagogue in London, um, which is, you know, adjacent to a mosque and the local community has since become um, predominantly Muslim and is no longer predominantly Jewish. And, you know, the Jewish community in London has moved north um, in the course of the last century. So. You know, there, there are very different um, ways that this proximity is brought into being. Um, and then, of course, there are parallels that I didn't necessarily get to discuss here in terms of a political history of partition, where, of course, India's partition in 1947 and, you know, Israel-Palestine's partition in 1948. And there's lots to say about that that isn't like it's not a mere historical coincidence. I mean, in both cases, you had a British colonial system, which really thought that only white Protestants were kind of you know, capable of properly living together with people not like themselves. 
um, is the short version of that story. And so they brought a similar ideology of kind of religious separation, I think, to their dealings with both groups of people. I see, okay. thank you. There's a question from Ms. Andrea Spindle, who works for the Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation. And uh, her question is, is the portrayal of Jews in anti-Semitic tropes part of the culture in South Asia or the anti-Semitism of the authors themselves or both? There are also Benny Ephraim and Benny Menashe there in, in India. Yeah, so to respond to sort of two parts of that question, I mean, the Bene Ephraim and Bene Menashe are thought to have sort of a slightly different history. Um, they're often considered like what, Judaizing groups, which is a different term for groups that have kind of more recently um, come to affirm their Jewish identity. And there are certainly, you know, there, there are different perspectives on what it means for those groups to consider themselves Jewish, though they've really only begun to identify as Jews more so in the 20th, late 20th, late 20th and 21st century, um, in contrast to the other groups I was discussing that have kind of a long history as identified Jews in, in India. Um, in terms of the anti-Semitic tropes, I mean, one of the things that I would say about something like the Merchant of Venice is that particular trope, of course, has come into South Asia from Britain through the long history of colonial contact. Um, Merchant of Venice is actually the very first play that was ever, like in English, that was ever produced in India um, to the best of you know, theater history's uh, ability to determine. Um, and it was extremely popular among the British garrisons in the 18th century, um, but there was sort of continuous contact by education and other forms of cultural exchange between um, the British and of course, people born in India. So those tropes are also now part of the vocabulary that contemporary writers in English get to draw on. Um, I mean, as far as the authors themselves, I mean, I don't think that, I, I don't look at a writer like Salman Rushdie as anti-Semitic. And what I wanted to suggest in my talk is that it's more simplistic than sort of dividing the world into, particularly in South Asia, you know, the, the anti-Semitic and the philo-Semitic. Um, I think that he is drawing on a great deal of complexity. Um, there are, when he depicts a character like Hind as anti-Semitic, he's not necessarily endorsing that, but he is commenting on a political history in which anti-Semitism has been deployed, right, in South Asia, which, I mean, of course, I know Dr. Afridi has written extensively about um, and can speak to, I think, in more detail than myself, um, and therefore has been become part of the vocabulary of some South Asian people. Um, I think depicting that doesn't necessarily make the author themselves anti-Semitic. So I hope that that clarifies. Okay, there is a lady here, uh, Ms. Shreya Saha, who would like to ask you a question if she could be unmuted. Shreya Saha, yes, yes. Could you please unmute her? Yeah, you should be able to unmute at this point. I can see that Elizabeth Solomon has also asked a question in the chat, which I'm yeah, happy. Yes, yes. Uh, Shreha, yes, please go ahead with your question. Am I audible? Yes, you are very clearly audible. Uh, my question is that, uh, as we know that the uh, Cochini Jewish community ha had lived in India over thousands of years, so do we get any reference of the Cochini Jews in the uh, travel narratives of the Europeans in the 16th and the 17th century? That's a really interesting question, and I have to confess that my primary expertise is on you know 20th and 21st century Indian literature rather than on sort of 16th and 17th century um, European travel accounts, which is an area I'm not nearly as familiar with. Um, I mean, we have other historical evidence for the community um, that goes back quite a long way, including there's a very famous plaque uh, about a land grant that was made by a local Hindu ruler to um, the Cochini Jewish community. Um, I'm, you know, I'm unsure about that one. I'd, I'd have to look further, but that's a really interesting question in terms of travel writing specifically. I mean, a lot of the travel writing, I think a lot of the early travelers, of course, 
are coming as well, not so much to the south of India, but more into the, you know, the large ports as well. So I'm really not sure. Yeah, we have in, in our midst uh, a Ben Israel writer based in Hong Kong. She has been writing short stories. Her name is Elizabeth Solomon, and she has posted a comment, and I would like, uh, I would request you to respond to that comment. She writes that as a Bombay Jew who grew up there and as a teacher of literature, this discussion of Indian Jewry is fascinating to me. The Indian Jewish voice is always missing. The doubt about the origins is also fascinating, given how devout the community generally is. Our community often gets talked about and analyzed, but their voice is never heard. It sort of makes me sad. Would you like to respond to this comment? I would. I mean, I, I would actually say there is there is an interesting body of, lit of literature by Indian Jews, and it's something that I have talked about myself elsewhere. Um, you know, I don't think it is the, necessarily the body of work where I look for, uh, you know, anti-Semitic representations or responses to that even so, but I mean, I, I direct you to writers like Esther David, um, who's very prolective and, you know, is a member of the Bene Israel community, still lives in Gujarat to this day. Um, Sophie Judah, who grew up in the community, but now lives in Israel. Um, so there, there definitely are some options out there. There's also um, Mira Mahadevan, who wrote a book that was originally published in Hindi as Apnagar, but then it was translated as Shulamit um, and published in the 1970s in English under that title. Um, it's unfortunately out of print, but copies are kicking around in libraries and on eBay. Um, you know, there are interest, there are some interesting engagements with anti-Semitism in those contexts too. Um, Esther David's son, Robin David, who is a journalist in India, has also written a book on the subject. Um, although they tend to follow, I, th I think that, you know, they negotiate different things. Um, you know, the issue of remaining in India versus emigrating is a prominent theme in those books. Um, the impact of partition is also covered, I think, repeatedly in those books. So there, there are some, um, you know, there are some interesting writers. <laughs> Elizabeth writes, I have the indigenous writers books, all of them. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's, that's quite interesting is that in many ways, even as the community has gotten, you know, demographically smaller, in many ways, the writers have risen in prominence for a variety of reasons. I mean, Esther David, I think, deserves her prominence because she is such a prolific and accomplished writer. Although there also has sort of been a strand of appropriation of Esther David internationalist discourse, where you know there's a famous moment in her book, The Book of Esther, where like she decides to leave Israel and decides she doesn't fit in and she wants to return to India. And she symbolically, like, you know, puts her sari back on <laughs> now that she's back in India. And also people have, you know, sort of looked at this moment and said, oh, well, this is kind of this wonderful moment that affirms her Indianness and affirms her belonging on the subcontinent. But then there's all kinds of other things that happen later, particularly as like the political situation continues to deteriorate in Gujarat into the 1990s and 21st century. Um, that like have her back away from that sense of celebration of herself as Indian a little bit. Um, and that gets more critically neglected. Uh, if I may share with the audience, there is also one more Indian Jewish writer who is very interesting, given the fact that she is the only Jewish writer today who publishes in the Hindi language. She has till now published three novels, but of those three novels, only one novel of hers, the last, depicted the community that she was born in, the Ben Israel community. The, that novel, that Hindi novel is titled Miss Samuel Ek Yehudi Gatha, which is, uh, which is being translated into English by a professor of English literature at Lucknow University, and is also being translated into the Hebrew language by Yifa Yaakov, who lives in England. That's really interesting. And I look forward to reading that English translation because that is, you know, unfortunately the only form in which I will be able to read the novel. Um, I see that there's a question about the, the novel Aliyah. So yeah, the novel is called Aliyah and it's spelled A-L-I-Y-A-H. And then there's a colon, the last Jew in the village. Um, the author publishes under just one name, Sethus, uh, S-E-T-H-U. Um, 
you can find it in English probably on Amazon. I think it was published by if not sure, it was by HarperCollins India. Um, yes, so yes. it's been pretty, you know, it's it's widespread. It's got widespread availability in commercial form. Um, so I would imagine you'd be able to, um, if not buy it locally, probably buy it online without too much difficulty. Oh, and I see. Uh, all right, thank you. You you posted the link for me. Yes, that is the novel. I would also like to add that Sheila Rohika's son too is a novelist, and he publishes yes. in English. His name yes. is Akash Verma. He has published a number of novels, none of which depict the community that he, uh, his mother was born in. His novels are thrillers. Absolutely. And, you know, I haven't provided here a complete list of all the Indian Jewish writers, um, nor all the Indian Jewish writers who write specifically about Jews. And because I'm interested in issues of representation, while well, Jewish writers can, of course, tackle any subject, I, you know, I haven't addressed those novels at all. Um, you know, there's also, you know, diasporic novels who might, one might consider. Um, I like Kermit Delman's um, memoir, Burnt Bread and Chutney. Um, she is a, an, an Indian, well, a, a a Jewish woman of Indian descent um, who largely grew up in the United States. And so she centers her experience there, though she also considers, you know, her family history in India, um, as well as her family connections in Israel. Um, Sadia Shepherd's The Girl from Foreign is another interesting American example um, where she, Sadia Shepherd herself is raised Muslim, but her grandmother was born into the B'nai community in what was then Bombay um, and eventually lived as a Muslim in Pakistan. And so, you know, that book explores from family history um, and positions Shepherd kind of within that family history. So there's there's a number, there's a number of examples, I think, both on the subcontinent, but also in the diaspora um, to look at. And it's yeah, the, the list is longer than one might expect. Uh, Professor Gujan, I've seen you. If I could ask you a question, I was wondering if you have stumbled upon any references to Jewish characters in the English novels produced by Pakistani and Bangladeshi authors. That's a really even, good question. You, you, even if the, the depiction of the Jewish characters in those novels wasn't anti-Semitic yet, I would be interested in knowing if there are any Jewish characters in the fiction produced in English in Pakistan and Bangladesh. Yeah, that's fair. Um, off the top of my head, I haven't found any in Bangladeshi literature, but I'm going to, you know, sort of admit right from the beginning that I am less familiar with Bangladeshi literature. I mean, there's India alone already produces an abundance of literature that I think even being on top of just the literature of that country is, is a tall order. Um, and so I'm going to admit that I'm, I'm less familiar with some of the other liter uh, national literatures on the subcontinent. I'm thinking about Pakistani literature, and I feel like that there are, I feel like that there are probably some examples that I'm struggling to come up with. Um, I mean, certainly there are, I mean, the, the other question becomes, you know, how do you define Pakistani if you're focusing particularly on, you know, post-1947 or post-1973 literature? Um, I think much, much less so. I mean, there's, there's some, I think, interest, as you know, in the Karachi Jewish community that existed prior to partition. Um, but then that is, I think, an interest that largely seems to place the community in the past. Um, I don't have any good examples that are actually coming to mind right now. So that's that's a good question that I should perhaps consider further. I was, I was just wondering because I am aware of some Urdu novels written in Pakistan, uh, which do not depict uh, Pakistani Jews, but are in fact thrillers and uh, portray Jews as spies working for Mossad and uh, conspiring against the Muslim world. So I, I was wondering if there, there are similar depictions in English language fiction too produced in Pakistan. And I have the same question for the English fiction produced in Sri Lanka. Yeah, that's, those, are, those are really interesting questions. And you know, one of my own personal limitations is that while I did study the Urdu language as a PhD student, um, what was on offer to me at the time was I think, not sufficiently advanced for me to progress to actually reading or new novels in the original. Um, and I do have some regret 
it's about that. And unfortunately, in, in where I do in Canada, I haven't improved my language skills any in the years since. The opportunity just has not arisen. Um, and so while I'm certainly really interested to learn more about what you're saying about the older literature, I don't have that direct familiarity. Um, in terms of the English literature, I certainly wouldn't say that I have encountered any that propagates those kinds of stereotypes. I mean, if anything, it would sometimes be an acknowledgement that such a stereotype exists, but also, you know, a distancing from those ideas. But then again, you know, many of the Pakistani literature, much of the Pakistani literature that has become prominent in English has been that literature that is so interested in um, embracing, you know, transnationalism, diasporic identity, hybridity. And so I think occupies a very different space from the position of, you know, fearing international interference, right? That those kinds of narratives that you identify um, would seem to embrace. I know that doesn't fully answer your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Should I answer some questions from the chat? Because I can see that there are some yes, further questions. Yes, yes. I was also looking at the chat box. I can see that there's a question, what is the status of the Jewish Indian community today? And I mean, while some part, some aspects of that community remain very active, I mean, certainly Mumbai has a very active Jewish community to this very day. Um, the Ben Ephraim community remains very vital. There are some communities that have become very, very small um, and their members are primarily abroad. I would say that of the Jewish community in Calcutta, which is very small, um, you know, and I think continues to have its site supported by both non-Jewish members of the local community and by Jews abroad who remain invested in that history. I'd say the same is true of the Cochini Jewish community. Um, the communities themselves are, um, you know, quite demographically diminished, if not kind of still, though still, I think in some ways, spiritually and intellectually vigorous. Thank you so much, Professor Goodman, for this wonderful lecture and for so patiently answering all the questions. I'm afraid we have run out of time now, so there is no room for any further questions. I hand over the reins of the program to my colleague, Mr. Gubuma now, with a profuse thanks to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Gutman. I think it was a really rich conversation, and I think we've all uh, got some uh, good summer reading options now to consider in the uh, months ahead. I uh, did want to let everybody know here today that uh, the the lecture that we had scheduled for next week unfortunately had to be uh postponed at this time i uh do hope we were able to reschedule that for uh some future uh, occasion maybe in the fall when uh, hopefully this seminar series can uh, be relaunched uh, with a new slate of uh, lectures um this will be our our last session today with uh that Dr. Afridi has been able to uh, so beautifully organize for us uh, throughout these last several months. Uh, do want to give a special thanks to him for convening all of the uh, amazing lectures as part of this uh, seminar series. Uh, we've built up a nice, uh, a nice community here, and uh, we're really, really grateful for all the efforts he's made over these past several months. Um, and we do hope everyone can join us again when. Uh, Things hopefully relaunch in the fall. I know uh, a lot's changing in the world, but uh, we do hope to still continue these uh, amazing lectures that are exploring uh, trends and histories in South Asia and to better understand uh, anti-Semitism as it's more figure out in the world. Uh, once again, thanks. And uh, with that, uh, we look forward to seeing everybody soon. Take care now. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, our pleasure. Thanks again. It was a great session. And many, th and many thanks to everybody who joined us during the series and also for today's webinar.